atmosphere. I mean, a great core group. You've got a mega church. If, if you all would come to Wyoming, we would have the biggest church in Wyoming. It's awesome. So, uh, it, and really, uh, th- this is really near to our heart. We've known you all for many years, and uh, you've all had a, been, been a huge blessing to us. And, uh, and so we have some of the sweetest memories. We remember the old building. And uh, that, man, I had some sweet memories back then. So anyway, I thank God for you. And so we want to do anything we can to help you. And, uh, and so, uh, what's that? Well, thank the Lord. I appreciate that. I, last night, I, you, you all were really warm to me. I really, really appreciated it. And I enjoyed talking with you. And I still feel kind of funny way up here, all of this far away from me. I'm a little closer to my folks, you know. So on Wednesday nights, I have a podium. I come right down in front of everybody. I don't, you know, I get right down with them. So, but anyway, um, I'm gonna, I, we're going to be getting a lot of scriptures. And, uh, and so if you would like to take notes, because you may want to remember some of them, because, you know, I'm going to try to go fast, because I've got a lot to cover. And uh, you may, if you'll turn, but if you don't turn, at least write the notes or write, you know, write them down. And I'm just going to start off with something. But you know, I'm just sharing with these two brethren today, and uh, we were talking about it. Uh, I guess it was mentioned that the church, this church is, uh, I mean, you all know the trials you've been through. You've been hurt really badly, and to the point where it's like you're in the ER or intensive care unit, nearly flatline, could be. But uh, the thing that came to my mind is it could be that, or you could be in a birthing center. This could be the very thing that God's going to use to birth you into something, a whole different thing. And God would want a New Testament church here uh, like never before. And I'm not saying, I don't know one way or the other. You all have to decide and know what is a New Testament church. What, if you are, I'm going, to, I'm going to preach tonight about what a New Testament church is by, with God's help. But I'll tell you something, there's a huge resetting going around. And this is all over the nation. I have met, I don't want to scare you off, I've just met some crazy things uh, in the past few years, I was at a meeting one time, as a Baptist meeting, uh, about two or three years ago, and there were in that group, uh, there was, I think I counted something like nine different pastors who had in the past year and a half of that time been baptized, scripturally baptized. They'd been in a ministry, most of them had been in ministry for many years, and they were baptized, they were immersed somewhere, you know. And this is just, th- these men came to it by themselves, nobody, there was no preaching about this, nothing. So, uh, and I'm not going to talk about that tonight, really, but I'm just telling you, that's, that seems extreme, I know. But uh, it's funny, because I had a friend I've known many years, and he was a, a Bob Jones graduate. Well, you know where those guys stand, right? All right. Oh, come on, it's all right. <laughs> it's a, he's a very good man. He's made, been on a long journey. And, man, he got, he got right in a King James Bible. He got right on a whole bunch of stuff, on, on a bunch of stuff. And I'd see him every five years or so, it seemed like I'd bump into him. And uh, the, the time before, the last time I met him, he was really getting into what is a biblical New Testament church. And uh, he was, I mean, we're, he was kind of like right where I was at, you know. And the last time I saw him, and he's in North Carolina, and we were sitting at Burger King, and he went like this and nudged me. He said, hey, did you hear I got baptized last month? <laughs> I said, wow, brother. Well, he said, yeah, I had to get it. I had to just get it right, you know. And I'm like, man, I mean, here's a man of God that's been preaching for many years and been baptizing people for many years. He said, I just couldn't, I had to get it right. So anyway, I really, I hope I didn't throw a wrench in everything. I don't it'd make you think like, oh boy, this guy's radical. But I'm just telling you that there's, this is kind of going around where people are like, you know what? They're rethinking some things. And like, what is a New Testament church? And so I want to deal with that. And, uh, and, and I've seen people that are at the birthing center, and it's a joy, by the way. It is a joy. It comes out that way. And this could be, God could get some glory out of something out of here. And you've been through a hard, I mean, you've been hit by a huge fireball, and you all know that. But maybe God has something good to come out of that. All right, I'm going to open in prayer, and I'm just going to start. Lord, we're grateful to you for your goodness, and we're thankful, Lord, for this church body here and this group of people. And Lord, there's certainly a godly core of your people here, Lord, and that where they are, have come together and they love you. I just ask you, Lord, for your special blessing that you'll come down and would know your presence tonight. I pray, you, Lord, you'd help me illuminate my mind. I'd be able to speak. But most of all, I pray that you will illuminate the hearts and prepare the hearts of those that are here. That this church body, Lord, will come, Lord, and do exactly whatever your will is. And that you'll provide for them the man of God. And surely, Lord, that while they're going through this time, is a time of trial to see what, which way they'll go. And perhaps, Lord, we understand that's going to determine what you're going to do and who you're going to give and who you're going to provide. 
So, Lord, I just ask, Lord, you help and press upon our hearts that we be completely obedient in all things, that we get the best of whatever you have to give us, Lord, And uh, as we go through this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want to ask you something. I'm going to ask you an elementary question. Now, some of you weren't here last night, so I may, you know, go over a little bit. And I already know where you're at here, and I know what the answer, what you're going to say. But uh, we're going to ask, first of all, what is a New Testament church? And so let me ask, is the Catholic church a New Testament church? No, how come? Anyone know why? <laughs> well, for one thing, it wasn't founded by Christ, right? If it wasn't founded by Christ, then it's not his church. It's really a culmination of different cults and a bunch of pagan idolatry and all kinds of stuff. We understand that, right? Also because it doesn't have the right doctrine. Those are two points right there, and uh, that, that's enough, right? Succession and, and their, uh, their continuity. Both of those things are, you know, they're off. And so you can pretty much scratch them, scratch them off if any of the, those three points I talked about last night aren't there. And uh, so then let me ask another rhetorical question. So how about all the churches that came out of the Catholic Church? Because the Lord calls the Catholic Church the mother of harlots, and so that means the mother of harlots has daughters that are harlots. And does that mean they're all lost and going to hell? No. Uh, the, the churches aren't. I mean, excuse me, I'm, the people aren't necessarily, because salvation's by, what's it, salvation by? It's by grace, it's not by church, right? So I'm gonna, this one's going to floor you. Is it possible that there are Christ, saved people who are Catholic? I, one of my best friends is a Baptist pastor. He was a Catholic for 12 years. He was saved as a saved Catholic for 12 years. I know that floors you. I know that's not supposed to be the answer, but he was saved by the grace of God. He went to a Baptist uh, VBS as a child, got saved as a young man, I guess a teenager, and there he was a Catholic for 12 years, and, and, uh, and God used that and later on dealt with him, and of course he became a Bible-believing Baptist. All right, so there are, I believe, because salvation is by grace, it's not by church. Now, that's contrary to what Catholicism teaches, and that's contrary to what Protestantism teaches at its very core. Even though Protestants say salvation by grace, they also, and I'll get into this, and you'll see why, it's integral in their doctrine that salvation is by church. All right? And so what makes us think that there are any churches today? Are there New Testament churches today? We're asking, what is a New Testament church? How would you know one if you saw one? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's so that we know that we do know, of course, that there are churches today. There has to be. The Lord promised perpetuity when he commissioned his New Testament church. And he told them, he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so all, all the way to the end, there will be, okay? He also said in Mark 16, 18, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we are not as the cultists or as the reformers who believe that the gates of hell did prevail and that the Lord's promise was broken and, uh, and his being with us all the way and that uh, all those groups, they all believe that they restored the true church. All of them. Whether they're a cult like Mormonism, they believe they restored the true church, right? Well, that's what Protestants believe too. They believe that the gates of hell did prevail and that they have restored a true church. And they came out of Catholicism. All reformers believe that and all cultists believe that. Nearly, I guess as far as I understand all cultists, I believe the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that and the Mormons believe that. There may be a cult that doesn't believe that, but you know, uh, for, the, for the sake of the study, they typically do. They, all, they obviously believe there's something. The Seventh-day Adventists, they believe that there's something that they've restored and, and that it did prevail, the gates of hell did prevail, and that it's gone into apostasy. All right, now the Lord's church was entrusted with the kingdom of God. If you turn to Luke 22, I'm going to uh, refer to this a few times probably tonight. Luke 22, verse 29. The Lord's church was entrusted with the kingdom of God. And he says in Luke 22, in verse 29... He says, and, and he's telling his church here, okay? And this is when he's instituting the Lord's table. And he says, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. And so he's appointing the church the kingdom. All right? Now, well, I, I've got several directions I want to go here. But with that in mind, and I'm going to try to probably go back here and backtrack a little bit. If you've turned to Acts chapter 8. 
I want you to understand that the kingdom of God is now, it's from that point on, and from then, and it continues. And the reason why that's important, it's not just redundant, because this is, this is what makes us Baptist. Ultimately, this is what the difference between us and Protestants. There's, there's several ultimate things, okay, but that spring from this. But uh, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, and it says here, it says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, here's the point that I'll, I'll give you the antithesis to this. And here's what I was brought up in. And maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, I was taught this in Bible college. I've, taught, I've, I've heard preachers say it, uh, that basically the kingdom of God was offered to Israel. Israel refused it. And, uh, and it, it was offered again at Pentecost, and Israel refused it. And so the kingdom of God was taken back, and the promise was, was put on hold that the kingdom of God will come one day. Well, that's interesting because the disciples are preaching the kingdom of God. It was appointed unto his church, and they continued to preach it the whole time. There's a reason why, and I, I, I'm not trying to use Protestantism as a straw man here, but there's a reason why they, continue, they must preach that the kingdom of God is not now because they're not in it. All right, they may be saved by the grace of God. However, that, and this is one of the reasons why they persecuted Baptists for Protestants, brethren, saved by grace of God, persecuted Baptists, uh, burned them at the stake. They may or may not have been saved personally, but they believed in the same, they had the same Bible we did. Now, if you turn to Acts chapter 19, and, and I, the, from there, I'm going to quote several verses just for the sake of time, but to prove to you that they're preaching the Word of God, the, the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 8, and this is the Apostle Paul here, long after Pentecost. And he says in verse 8, he says, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. He's preaching the kingdom of God there. This is not some kind of thing that's been offered and not refused. He's still preaching it. And in Acts 20, I'll, I'll just read these in verse 5. He says, And now behold, I know that ye all, among, uh, ye all among whom I have gone preaching, the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. In Acts 28, in verse 23, he says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came to him, unto him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning until evening. He's preaching this kingdom of God to the Jews. And, and uh, toward the end there in, in, uh, in Acts 28 verse 31, he was doing this. It says he was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. My point on this, Paul's preaching the kingdom of God right up to the time he gets his head chopped off. So evidently there's something here more than what what typically meets the typical uh, religious system, the kingdom of God was very, very important to the apostles. And we are to keep the, we keep the apostles' doctrine. That's, that's the mark of, of who we are as a New Testament church, is by keeping the, the apostles' doctrine. Now, ultimately, if you trace it down in history, it's the kingdom of God that makes us Baptist. And uh, the apostles, they were Baptist, okay, in the sense of, the sense that we're, we understand it. Now, the New Testament church historically held that the kingdom of God is real and literal, and it's a present reality, and, and, but all other Christians, many of your Christian brethren, they believe it's a future reality, not a present reality. Uh, many believe that it will come about by government. If we do such, if we, if we vote the right man in, and if we do enough things in our society, we can usher in the kingdom by making our society more pure. That's where uh, we lived in. We've lived all over the place. We've lived in North Carolina. My wife's from there. Uh, my, when I, my ship was in, in Virginia. They had in Virginia, they still had some of what's called blue laws. Y'all know what that is? Blue laws? Do you have those here? That's where there's certain things you can't do on Sundays, you know, that kind of thing. I always thought it was kind of funny. In, in Carolina, they did that too. You couldn't buy beer from like 10 o'clock in the morning till two o'clock in the afternoon on Sundays. I'm like, they're just going to buy the beer at nine o'clock or at three o'clock. I mean, what's, you know, but anyway, the idea was you're trying to form society, right? To try to make it more Christian. And the, I, there was an idea. It was a Christian society and they wanted to try to form things enough where the society would get good enough where they could usher in the kingdom. Well, the, it's Protestant. 
That's Protestantism from the very beginning. If you remember who the colonies were settled, the Church of England, they had state churches, right? And so they would, in that, that's what, the, that's what their purpose was to do. Now, um, uh, and so, the, but the kingdom is a present reality. So you say, well, wait a minute. What about where it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done? Well, I'm glad you asked, okay? If it says, thy kingdom come, how can you say the kingdom is here now, that it, it, it was uh, founded during Christ's ministry? Well, uh, let me tell you a very, uh, very easy answer to that is there are three parts to the kingdom of God, just as there's three parts about everything that deals with God. There's three parts to you. Did you know that? Body, soul, and spirit. Amen. Okay. Did you know there's, uh, there are three parts to the resurrection, the first resurrection? There's three parts. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, there are many people that rose with him, right? Okay, of the just, right? They rose, they went into the city. You know, there's going to be another part. When the rapture comes, that's not going to be the first, because there's already been it. The Lord rose, he's the first fruits of the rose from the dead. Well, there's going to be another, when, when, that, when that trumpet blows, boy, I'd like it to be tonight. You know what? There's going to be the dead are going to be raised, but you know what? That's not the last part of the, of the first resurrection. Did you know that when he returns after the tribulation, there will be tribulation saints that will be killed? And guess what's going to happen to them? They will be raised. But they're part of the first resurrection. So there's three parts to many things in, that deal with God and have to do with, with in, in, the, in the, the world even, and uh, what God deals with. All right. And so, um, and so in dealing with that, let me show you where, first of all, where the kingdom of God, how it was established in Christ's time. If you turn to Daniel chapter number two, I've got to prove this out before I can get to preaching it. Okay. So I'll, get, I'll start hacking later. All right, let, let, me, let me get the facts out here, and then I can go, ha! <laughs> All right. But if you turn to Daniel chapter 2 in the Old Testament, we understand that the kingdom would be established in the time of Christ. All right? And, uh, and so I've got it written here, but I'll... Uh, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and just for the sake of time, you all understand the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had about the statue, the thing that had the head of gold and so on? All right, you're already there. You already understand that. All right, so here's the interpretation. In uh, verse 44, it says, And in the days of these kings... Now, by the way, those are all kings. Remember the head of gold? And then there's the, the brass and so on. It goes on down to the two legs of iron. And, and you all know what that is. It was Medo-Persia. It was, you know, and then there was the Grecian Empire that came later. All right? And that was the, the, the torso of brass, whatever. And then the legs, Roman Empire. Why two legs? Because the Roman Empire split between east and west. Istanbul which is now Istanbul, it was Constantinople, it was established, the Roman Empire in the east, and then, in, of course, in Rome. So you've got two legs right there. And they're the legs of iron, and they, they trample everything the Rome, the Rome did, all right? And there's vestiges of that left, all right, still today. However, here's the point what he's saying. He says, and these are all kings. He says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and a kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And did it break in pieces the iron and brass and the clay and the silver and the gold? The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. The point is, it's going to be in the days of those kings. Did the Lord come in the days of Nebuchadnezzar? No. Did he come in the days of Alexander the Great? No, and so you, you understand, or during the Medo-Persian Empire or, or the Greek. However, he did come during the days of the kings of the Roman Empire, right? So you know that the Lord Jesus Christ had to come during that time. But when he came, what did he do? He established a kingdom. Now, you say, wait a minute, we don't see no throne, no palace, we don't see an army. That, it, right, exactly. And I'm going to get into that. Why? But he did establish his kingdom, and we're going to be looking for where that kingdom is. All right? And so it was, it was established with the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist preached the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ preached the kingdom of God, and he appointed it to his church, and they continued to preach it and, uh, and to their death. And whereas Protestantism believes that it was offered to Israel and rejected, as I mentioned. Now, the present reality of the kingdom of God was so important to ancient Baptists, they would go to the stake over this. Because, you see, the, many of the Protestant state governments themselves, they would establish their own little city on a hill. They wanted their government, that was the, the, the kingdom, and no way are they going to accept the New Testament church. They are the reformers of, they were the reformers of Catholicism, men like uh, Calvin. And, uh, and by the way, in Calvin's federal system of the church, 
if you were baptized, if you were caught, when the Baptists, when they were caught baptizing, they would put you in a cage and, and, and hold you over the big lake and down you go and you're going to be baptized for, for good. That's, that's the last baptism. And people did that. They were baptized willingly knowing that they could very well easily be put to death for this, for baptism. You could be burned at the stake too, by the way. It could be any, any one of those things. And so uh, that it was the, the reason for the envy or whatever. Of course, you know, Catholicism did to many of the saints and so on. All right. Now, that's the first part of the kingdom. It was established. We understand there was a prophecy from Jacob himself. He said that there will not cease to be a lawgiver between the feet of Judah until Shiloh come. Well, he came in the days of these kings and he established a kingdom. Now, the second part is the fullness of the kingdom. And that's when Jesus Christ returns physically and we will, we will see him rule and reign in Jerusalem and he'll have a one world, a true uh, government of peace. And uh, this is the part that, that the Jews were expecting. Now, if you look at Luke chapter number 17, the Jews wanted to see the Messiah come in and triumph. Of course, they still would have rejected him, but <laughs> they, wanted it. they were expecting a messianic triumph that's going to wipe out Rome. And so this is why the Pharisees who rejected Christ, and in verse 20, uh, they came to him and they said, this is the, these are lost people, they're saying, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, in verse 20 here, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now let me ask you a question here. I've heard people use this text before. I, I have done it myself. Well, the kingdom of God is dwelling somewhere inside, my, mystically and visibly inside you. That's where the true kingdom of God is. Who's asking him the question he's answering there? Were these saved people? These were Pharisees. They were lost. They hated Jesus Christ. And, and so we're going to say that the kingdom of God dwells within them? I don't think so. What he's telling them is that the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's right before your nose and you can't even see it. It's within you. It's within your sister right here. The kingdom of God was the disciples. They're healing people. They're preaching the word of God, baptizing and so on. It's within you. And that's the sense that he's speaking of. Not within the lost person's heart. Obviously, that don't work, right? And so, there, of course, that was, uh, it, it was, began there. Now, the kingdom of God, notice something, it does not dwell within, as I mentioned, within Christ uh, rejecting Pharisees. But also, something else here is that the kingdom of God does not come by observation. Now, here's the point, and this, will, this puts a kink in our Protestant brethren um, idea. And uh, they believe that the kingdom of God comes when the Lord comes. Well, the Lord says it comes not with observation. So when the Lord comes and every eye shall see him and he's sitting in the throne in Jerusalem, when we all go there to worship and we obey him, you're saying that's when the kingdom of God comes? Then there's a contradiction in Scripture. However, what he's talking about with observation, it's not coming with a big army. They're not setting up a big castle, a big throne. He's saying it's here. It's among you. It's in your midst. All right. And, so it was, and, and we know the promise from Daniel chapter 2. He fulfilled it. He established it in his earthly ministry. He appointed it unto his church. And they continued to preach it on throughout. Now, what's the third part of it? If you look at, um, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. You might be questioning, I don't know, you might say, wait a minute, I thought we were asking what a church is. Well, because the church is built upon the kingdom of God. You have to understand, uh, all, all these are connected together. And these are things that ancient Baptists, they didn't learn this in seminary, they learned it from the word of God, Amen. They were not allowed to go to seminary. Baptists weren't. Historically, not even in America. They couldn't go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. They, they learned it from the, the, from the man of God and with the Bible, and that's their education. And they're always put down by the Harvard guys. You know, people are like, well, those farmer preachers. Yeah, they knew the word of God. And this, their doctrine came from that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, it says, Then cometh the end... When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And for he must reign till he hath put 
all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he said all things be, are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Point is, the last part, after the Lord returns, he sets up his millennial kingdom. He will put down all things. The last thing will be death. And then at the end of that thousand year reign, he's going to yield it all up to the Father and it's all going to be one. And that's where we see that there'll be the new heaven and new earth and so on. Okay, so that's the third part of, but that's, so you get an understanding of the kingdom of God. If anyone ever says, oh, wait a minute, the kingdom of God is to come, you, you, you can lay them out, okay? You can say, yeah, it, you know, it, when he's talking about thy kingdom come, he's talking, that's what he's talking about. It's going to come, but I mean, in, in, uh, when, when, the Lord, when the Lord is all in all. All right, um, and uh, moving on along here. Now, <clears throat> Uh, of course, the cults and Catholic organizations and religious brethren, they may be saved, they may not be, by the grace of God, either way. But typically, they believe they, uh, in, for an example, in Catholicism, they have a system that's wed with the state and uh, to enforce it. And that's why Baptists believe in separation of church and state. That's very important to us. That's a Baptist doctrine, by the way. That's not from the worldly people that seem to, they get a, you know why they get a, the wrong idea of that? You've all heard the atheists say, oh, we believe in separation of church and state. They really don't. But um, honestly, they get that. That was borrowed. Thomas Jefferson, uh, he wrote that in the Federalist Papers because he got it from the Baptist. And he said as much. And uh, what they're saying, of course, as you understand probably, that it, the state cannot choose a, a church. Now, here's the point, though. The atheists have heard so many Christians talking about the church as if it was, as if it was salvation, that church is Christianity, that, that that's where their point comes from, is that they believe in a separation. They think it means the separation of government and Christianity. And that's not at all what our Constitution was founded upon. They got it from the Christians, from Christians misunderstanding, uh, from their wrong uh, placement of doctrine. All right, and so we understand, of course, the daughters of the Catholic Church, also they follow the state church thing. There's the Church of England, there's the Church of Scotland, there's the Church of... Uh, Germany has two state churches. Did you know that the, the framers of the Constitution wanted to have a state church? And they were going to follow Germany's example. They wanted to have the Church of England and the Baptist Church. Now, Baptists were not in denominations, but they were going to make them that. And you know who protested it vociferously? The Baptist. <laughs> a, a number of, of, uh, of, of godly men went and protested and said, no, we believe that there should be no state church whatsoever because they saw what happens when, that, when, when the state and the church come together. All right. Um, and so now in the, the system of Catholicism, Protestantism, so on, they believe that church equals salvation. I'll bet you've all heard that. I'll bet you've all, I, I grew up hearing that. Um, maybe not said quite that way. Uh, but uh, And that came from old doctrine. If you weren't part of the church, you were consigned to hell. Um, just for an example, let me ask you something. How many of you ever heard rapture of the church? You've heard that term? Is that in the Bible? Is the church going to be raptured? Do you have to be part of a New Testament church to be raptured? No, it's, it's the same. All we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. It's not rapture of the church. It's rapture of the saints. Amen. If you're saved by grace, you're going to be raptured. You follow? I'm, I'm getting some puzzling looks. I need to get down here in the front here and try to get y'all together. All right. I want to make sure you're with me on this, all right? It's okay to say amen or whatever, nod or laugh. Whatever. And if you don't, shake your head. I'll, I'll explain some more. But we've been conditioned so much that church is salvation, that there's a true church, and that's everyone that's saved, and then there's the, the, the visible church. There's no such concept in the Bible whatsoever. There's either, there are saved people, they're saved by the grace of God, and there's also a New Testament church. And it's not the same. You can be saved and never be scripturally baptized. Do you all believe that? Amen. We, vote, we are the only people, and you know what? What makes you Baptist is baptism, but we are the only people that believe, vote, I mean very strongly believe, that baptism is not salvation. All right, and so that, that's something that's so important to us. That our forefathers would die over that very thing. All right. And, uh, and so uh, now there is such a thing. We have to understand the family of God. Now the Bible says in, in, uh, in Ephesians, 
Uh, I've got the verse here. Where was it? Ephesians. I'm looking for my verse. Anyway, I'll find it here as I'm going along. But there, oh, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, if you're saved by the grace of God, you're my brother. We're part of the same family. You follow? That's why we call each other brother. Now, you might be a Pentecostal. Now, don't think I'm liberal. Don't hit, okay, wait a minute. You know, I'm not liberal. I just want to be Bible. You could be a Pentecostal. If I'm convinced you're saved by the grace of God, I might even call you brother. All right? You just got to get right on your doctrine, okay? You're not part of the same body. You're not part of the same church. You're not part of a New Testament church. You can't be if you're going to be a Pentecostal, all right? You, all right. However, uh, salvation's by grace. It's not by church. Thank God for that because I was not saved by church. Amen? It, God, the Lord calls out a people when they're saved. He calls them out and he forms them into his New Testament church. All right. Now, uh, and since, of course, since baptism is in, in the minds of Catholicism and Protestantism and many of our brethren who call themselves Baptists, uh, they, they believe what's called a true church. I mentioned that already. And, uh, and then there's also a true, a true baptism, an unseen baptism that, that goes right along with the true church. It's all invisible and mystical. It goes right along with an invisible mystical testimony and your invisible mystical obedience to the Lord. Amen? It's all, it all comes from the same source. All right. And, uh, and so, uh, anyway, but you know what? Churches that baptize under that doctrine, when they believe there's a true baptism, it's an unseen baptism, they get that because, they, because of the ancient doctrine, one of the very first doctrines that entered into Christianity was the idea that baptism saves you. If you look in Acts chapter 8, 37 sometime in the New Bibles... You, you, it's in the King James, of course. Thank God, okay, of course, because we have the pure Word of God here. In the New Bibles, it's missing. Not on all of them. Sometimes, because there's, it caused so much of a flack, or some people, they'll put a little mark on there and say, well, that's not found in ancient manuscripts. And a lot of them, you look at an NIV or whatever, it goes from Acts 8.36 to Acts 8.38. Well, the reason why that is is because that's the one place in the Bible that says you must be, where, he, where Philip takes the Ethiopian eunuch, and he says, what... He says, uh, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, if thou believest, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they went down and were baptized. That's, it says it's, I mean, you just can't deal with that doctrine if you believe in baptismal regeneration. Because he's he stipulated that you can only be saved if you're, or you can only be baptized if you're saved. All right, but that was from the very, we're talking like the second century here when that doctrine of baptismal salvation came into play. And it is a cornerstone in much of, uh, much of Protestant Christianity and, of course, Catholicism. And, uh, and so that's why you get the idea, they believe that when you were saved, you were mystically baptized, and you didn't even know it. Did anyone did you ever feel anything? Did you all feel wet when you got saved? And you didn't know? You know, God doesn't work that way. He doesn't work with against your mind like that. When you, when you came to be baptized, you submitted to be baptized. It was scripture was little, and you came out wet. Amen? All right. So, but this idea that baptism saves you, that's where they get that one Lord, one faith, one baptism. They claim to make that a spirit baptism. I've, I've shared that with you last night. And, uh, and I really, I need more time with this because if you're not with me on this, you don't understand. I'm going to, you're going to, you might either, um, I, I don't want to lose anybody on here, but uh, this is very important. It's historically always been important with Baptists because Protestantism has sunk in so much with people that call themselves Baptists, they just accept it. We've been sending our preacher boys to, bat, to a Protestant uh, Bible colleges for, what, 100 years, 75 years, something like that? And they come back believing Protestant doctrine, but they say they're Baptists. All right, so if the idea, if you believe in a mystical baptism, and I ask the brethren, I'll say, uh, okay, so you believe that one Lord, one faith, one baptism is speaking of a of a spirit baptism. They say, oh yeah, that's the one true baptism. I'll ask them, okay, brother, do you, do you baptize by water? They say, oh yes, we're Baptists. Well, then, then you know what, brother? You have two baptisms. And the Bible says there's one baptism. They say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. Because that water baptism is a picture of that one true baptism. And, and, uh, and I, already, I went over this last night some. But, but anyway, so my response to that is, well, brother, now you've got a water baptism that is a picture of a corrupt baptism, and baptism is a doctrine. There's no way we can accept that baptism. But a church that will accept, they, they say, oh, you came from such such Baptist church? Okay, you're, you're in, sign the card, and you're a member of this church. You've now brought that baptism, that doctrine, into your church body. Uh, there was a guy named E.L. Bynum a number of years ago. He said, the baptism you accept is the baptism you give. Now, if you accept uh, Church of Christ baptism, 
You all know what that is? Campbellite baptism? It's alien baptism. That means they believe that you are, you're not saved until you get in that water and get dunked. All right? And I, we talked about it last night. Do you, do you accept free will Baptist baptism? Why not? Really? I mean, uh, do you accept Pentecostal baptism? I've been in Baptist churches that accept any kind of immersion. They'll accept Pentecostal baptism. None of that is authorized through the New Testament church. It's completely Protestant, and they do believe it's a picture of the one true baptism. Therefore, what does it matter? I've even sat with one guy. Actually, he was honest. He played it out. He said, you know what? Really, it doesn't really matter. Baptism has nothing really to do with the New Testament church. He'll accept people without baptism. It was a Baptist church. He claimed it was. They were not a Baptist church, okay, obviously. Because the Lord instituted baptism. It must be important, folks. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm belaboring this a little bit too much, but I want to make sure you're with me. Um, so, but it is from the family of God, those who are saved by the grace of God, it's from those that the Lord calls out His church. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, this is important, because the church is the treasure hidden in the field. Matthew chapter 13. You're familiar with the parables. And in verse 44, Matthew 13, 44, if you're familiar, I'm just going to get right into it. It says, and again, again, the kingdom of heaven, and by the way, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same. You'll find many places where they're exactly the same and they're even used interchangeably. And I can prove that. I've known people that go around trying to say there's something different and I, they, because they have a system and they have a premise that they want to prove. Uh, but they're, the reason why Matthew calls it kingdom of heaven is because Matthew was written to the Jews. And the Jews, they use God, heaven instead of God all, all the time. When we say, you know, we, in English we'll say, I fear God. In Hebrew we say, I watch heaven. They don't use the name of God all the time like that. They, they'll replace heaven for God all the time, okay? And so that's why it's written to the Jews. You find kingdom of heaven only in Matthew because it's written to the Jews. All right, so he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now notice the man here, he bought the entire field, right? Did he buy the treasure? No, he bought the whole field, all right? And, uh, and so, but why did he buy the whole field? Obviously, for the treasure, all right? Now, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 is a good example of that. Uh, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ died for the world. He bought the whole field, all right? And uh, anyone who will enter into that field by the grace of God that will accept his offer of grace can be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. Not, not baptism. Not, I mean, you can, you, you're saved by the grace of God, period. Are you all with me on that one? All right, it's okay to say amen, all right? I appreciate it. All right. It's salvation is by grace, not by church, not by baptism, not by anything. All right. We got that nailed. All right. So now, uh, now the, the Lord used that husbands love your wife. It says that Christ gave himself for the church. Right. The man that bought the field, he bought it for the treasure. He bought, Christ gave it all for the church. It was the special treasure there. Now, you say, wait a minute, the church, that's used in the singular sense. Therefore, church must mean all y'all, everyone that's saved is church, right? Is that what it means? That's what people would use it. It's funny how, how, that's, how selective we can become on that. Because uh, we often, we all the time use a singular to denote something. Like we talk about the American home. How many American homes are there? How about we say the dog is man's best friend? How many dogs are there? How about the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things? Who can know it? How many hearts are there? When I say the Bible says, how many Bibles are there? You understand? We, we do that all the time. That's common grammar. It's called a synecdoche in the grammar, if you want the term. And uh, they use a singular all the time, and it gives a, it's kind of an emphasis. It's an emphasis on the institution of the church. Why the Lord? That's the hidden treasure. And that's what the Christ gave himself for. And so the most important thing to know is that you're saved by the grace of God and you're safely in the field that Christ gave everything for. But you know what we're interested in tonight is what is the New Testament church? Are we part of the treasure hidden in the field? Are we just a group of saved brethren who love one another and we agree on some things and we've come together? Which one are we? There's, in the field, there's all kinds of groups. There's groups and they all, you know, as people ought to agree with one another, Right? The Seventh-day Adventists, I, I would argue about salvation there, but I mean, if they're, I've known some, I believe that maybe you know, they, they attest to being saved by grace. I'm not going to argue that, but uh, name any other group, um, the Methodists. My grandparents were godly Wesleyan Methodists. 
My grandfather was saved by the grace of God. I, I am certain of it. He told me when he was saved, when he was a little boy. He told me when he believed, the, he thought he, they were out picking strawberries one hot day, and they'd been hearing these fireball Methodist preachers, I mean, just laying it out in the tents. I mean, back then, I mean, boy, I mean, they were hearing preaching everywhere. World War I had just concluded. They had a thing called an aeroplane now. I mean, the end of the world is, is on. And he was hearing this preaching, and he was picking strawberries, and he looked up one, with his grandmother and with his mother and uh, with his, I, I think, some, maybe his dad. And while he's just thinking on all these things, he looked up, and they're gone. He didn't know what to do. He went screaming. He's running around the farm. He's looking into the barn. They're not there. He's screaming out for him. He's running around the house. What, where are you? He, now, by now, he's, he's sure that he, the rapture happened, and he was left. And he came screaming. He ran into the house real quick and ran out screaming. And he came back in the house, and by this time he broke down. It was it. He's, he's going to hell. And he's just blubbering, and he heard a voice from the, down in the cellar. What are you blubbering about? And the, the, what it was, they'd gone down the cellar to get cool, and he'd been so engrossed in the preaching he'd been hearing uh, that he had lost. He didn't even see them or hear them leave. But he, he told me this. Like, you know, he, he was saved, but he, no, he was never scripturally baptized. No, he didn't have his doctrine right. But he's saved by the grace of God. Amen. He's my brother. He's my grandfather. But, uh, and so, um, anyway, so he's in the field. Thank God he's in the field. Amen. <laughs> All right. And so, anyway, are, so when I ask the question, what are we? Well, it's really not that very hard to find out the answer to that question. There's some things about a New Testament church that will reveal itself. Um, you know what? For one thing, in a New Testament church, and it, some of this is redundant, I, I covered last night, but Christ is the head of a New Testament church. Now, that seems very, very elementary, but however, that's really rare. That's about as rare as hen's teeth. You, you go to most churches, and they would attest to this very same thing. But uh, most churches, the pastor is the head of the church, or the deacons are the head of the church, or there's a honcho that's the head of the church, or a honches. Or a denomination. If, you're, if, if, if your church is a denomination, it's over. You, you already, you have no head. Uh, Christ is not your head. The denomination's your head. The association, whatever, that's your head. You, you, you send your tithe or whatever. They, part of their tithes, they go to Nashville for one big thing, and they answer to Nashville if you're Southern Baptist. All right. All right. And so, so number one thing about what a New Testament church is, Christ is definitely the head. I mean in your heart. Everyone, every member agrees that Christ alone is the head of the church. All right. And uh, and so uh, and you know what? Each member of the church has a spiritual gift. We covered those last night somewhat briefly. I'd love to teach on the spiritual gifts because I believe that would really be edifying to you. But you all have a, a, a spiritual gift and the Lord placed you into the body. The Bible says in first Chronicles twelve eighteen. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. And so he, he sets them in the body because it brings, there's a gift that you have and you are to make, by your gift that you have, is to make this church body function as a body. Otherwise, it's a dysfunctional body. If the, only, if the, if the, the pastor is the head, you've got a paralyzed body. You all just come, hear a sermon, give your tithe and go home. That's it. It's not a church though. All right. Now, a church that has Christ as their head also has true authority. And there's a candlestick. And that's a picture of that authority, which only comes from the Lord. You cannot claim to have a candlestick. It's get, the Lord gives it to you. Now, let me tell you something about the candlestick. That, that fire, that flame, God uses that from the very beginning as a picture. I could give you several examples. I'll read you one in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. It says, And there came a fire out from the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. This was in the desert. They, they had done everything that God said. They built the tabernacle. They built the altar. They put the offering on there, but there's no fire therein, right? And God sent the fire. Boom. And they fell on their face before God. You know what happened in the very next chapter, chapter 10 in Leviticus? You know, you know the story. It says here, and Nadab and Abihu, these are good men, by the way. When I was a kid, I heard in Sunday school, they teach, oh, these are evil guys. No, no. No, you see them. They're standing before God in many places. These are good men. These aren't unsaved guys either. These, Nadab and Abihu, the priest, it says, And they, the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible that said that they were not to use strange fire. There's people who say, well, there's nothing against this in the Bible. 
There's not, who says, like, you know what, you follow the protocol that God laid out and follow it. That's because that's God's protocol. If you want to do it God's way, if you want, to do, if you want God's will for your life, you're going to do it God's way, right? A church is the exact same way. We have to follow the protocol laid down by the apostles. If you say, yeah, but we've all done it this way, and there's nothing against it, well, make sure that it doesn't go against the way that God did it. Amen? All right? The ends do not justify the means. All right? And so God wham-smacked them for disobeying. Now, we can, I can go back to the, the burning bush. It's a picture of the authority of God, right? On that mountain. We we're going here. The fire came to the, to, the, to the altar, signifying that God's authority rests right there. And you do it God's way and not anyone's way. You, you do it another way, and God shows us by law first mentioned that he's displeased with that. We also know, do you remember when Solomon, they built the temple? And in 2 Chronicles 7, 1, it says, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from the heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. All right. Now, and I could go on to Elijah's fire and everything, but you get the point. All right. Now that brings us up to something in Acts chapter 2. When the people had prayed in Acts chapter 2, in fact, we, we might as well... Go there so you can. It's sometimes it's better to see it. The day of Pentecost, and it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. That cloven tongues of fire signifies, boom, God's putting his place of authority on his New Testament church right there. And uh, it was empowered. Now, the church was already formed. The tabernacle was already formed before God placed his power on it. It was according to God's way, and then God put his power on it, correct? The temple was according to God's way, and everything is done God's way, and Solomon's standing there, boom, God's power's on it. Now, Christ formed his church in his earthly ministry. He promised them that they'd receive the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them even before he left. And then he said, not many days hence you will receive power. And that power, boom, came upon him and was proof that that's where God's, where, where, where God's program exists. It's in his church. Now, the kingdom of God itself, it was, it was given, uh, the Lord gave the kingdom of God to his church. Now, everybody who, people who will not submit to the church, whatever, they're under the jurisdiction. And I'll get into some of that a little bit. Uh, in fact, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself on this, but uh, I, I want to get back to the candlestick of authority. Now, do you all remember in, if, in Revelation chapter 2, there's candlesticks, the churches, the seven candlesticks. All right, and these are these are these are before the Lord on the throne, and these are the representing the, these are his churches. And you know, and the Lord said to the churches, Hey, whatsoever is bound you bound in heaven or bound in earth is bound in heaven. He's recognizing them as an authority. They are the little embassy of the kingdom of heaven on earth. All right? And that flame symbolizes their authority that they are true. Now in uh, Revelation 2 5, the Lord tells the church of Ephesus, very important here, the church of Ephesus. He says, remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works or else I will come quickly and will remove that candlestick out of its place except you repent. You know why he said that? He said, you've left your first love. You remember the story on it? All right. First love is not a warm and fuzzy feeling. That's what I was taught. Oh, you've left your, you're not soul winning anymore. You're not, that's not what first love is, is dealing about. And, and I'll prove that. But the Lord was speaking to the church of Ephesus. Now let's go to, let's go to the book of Ephesians, the same church that received an epistle. And this is what the Lord is referring to. If you look at Ephesians chapter five and verse 22. I know it's kind of, some of this is maybe hard to absorb. You get it all at once. I'm giving you a shotgun blast because I'm leaving tomorrow morning. All right? So I can't, generally I can't, you know, it's hard to absorb it all at once. And so I'm, if you're taking notes, chew on it. You know, if something like, I ain't never heard it that way before, chew on it. All right? And call me. I'll talk to you, you know, whatever. But in, in Galatians 5, this same church is going to lose their candlestick. He says, and here's, uh, uh, it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as, the, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, 
and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Amen. Now, it says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives so as their own bodies... He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his wife and mother, and, uh, and, and excuse me, his father and mother, and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. In verse 32, this is the, the crux of it. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The whole point on this, the church of Ephesus was revealed that this thing, this relationship, that a church is to be like a woman and her husband, okay? The church is the wife. Christ is the, is the husband. Now, when a wife ceases to regard her husband for everything, and maybe perhaps she starts to regard another man or other things alongside her husband, does she still have her first love? Absolutely not. No, when she starts regarding other men or other authorities, she does not, she's not keeping this first, her first love. How many churches regard other things? I mean, immediately, if they have a denomination that they come under that, they've, they've, they've left their first love. And the consequence of that is what? Lose your candlestick. How many churches have, well, the pastor's the head of this church. Well, they've long, it's gone. It's gone. Because the Lord is not going to compete with another man. Amen? How many, no man is going to compete with another man for his wife. I mean, as far as when it comes to, you're not going to, obviously that's not going to happen. You're not going to, because she's left her first love, then it's over with. The, now, I didn't say that they're out of business. I didn't say they don't preach the gospel and that people aren't saved because the gospel is by what? It's by grace. Okay. The candlestick of authority is gone, but they can, people still get saved and they still baptize and they still have VBS and they still have Sunday school. Amen. Until eventually something happens, whatever. And eventually it crumbles or whatever. But they're just a, a group. But the authority, the first love is gone. All right. Now, um, the, most churches, of course, I don't believe they ever had a candlestick. And never, they have no idea what it is to lose one. Uh, the common interpretation of this by most many fundamental Baptists is that, well, first love is a warm and fuzzy feeling for the Lord and a candlestick is your pastor. And so if you don't have really, if your feelings for the Lord aren't really warm, then God's going to take your pastor away. Obviously, that church never had a candlestick. <laughs> they don't know what it is. The pastor's not the candlestick. That's your, your authority. That's your boom that God placed in there. And, and so if a church has one, it's going to, first of all, it's going to be founded correctly. It must, just like the tabernacle had to be done correctly, right? As the temple, every, and the church, everything has to be done according to God's order. And you can't say, well, okay, we got a candlestick now. It doesn't ever happen that way. We, it's a journey you strive on, like, you know what? We want to make sure that we're doing it God's way and that we have that power of God and that authority of God. And then whatsoever uh, is bound here on earth is bound in heaven. The Lord recognizes it, and there's that hedge of protection the Lord gives. All right? But, um, and so, anyway, the, the, now the metaphor, of course, of this, the bride, the wife, of the church, and so on, that does not illustrate salvation. A lot of people do that. They, they, they talk about like the bride of Christ is, is a picture of everyone that's saved. They actually make it an entity. It's actually just an illustration, is it not? You read it with me in Ephesians. Is that an illustration or is that some kind of entity there like there's some kind of thing called bride? No, it's a picture. Now that goes on into, into Revelation 19. It says here she's in uh, white and everything. And it's all a picture that we can see it. However, that is to the church. That's not all of Christianity. You know what the Lord, you know when I, my wife has three other sisters, two other sisters, but I only married one of them. When the, the Lord takes his wife, his bride out of the family, right? You, any of you guys that are married, you chose your bride from the family. You didn't marry the whole family, did you? All right, I'm hoping not. Okay, y'all not from Tennessee, are you? All right. <laughs> okay, you'll get that someday, but anyway. All right, but, and so there's the family of God, and there's the treasure, and there's the bride that's out of, it. that is the Lord's church, and we're given that in Ephesians chapter 5, it's a present relationship, it's not something that, that like, yep, one day we're going to be the, it's not that at all, 
And you can't ever say that you are anything. You're like, yep, we're the bride. We don't say that except in the sense of a metaphor. We are to behave like it. If he's the head of our church, then we answer to him as a wife would answer to her husband. And if you have that sweet relationship as a church, that's part, that's, so I'm asking, what is the New Testament church? This is one of the things that make a New Testament church what it is. Now, other, others can, I mean, you can have a great time. I've been in some great meetings. They're, they're not a church. I've been to camp meetings, and they're not a church. But boy, we sure had a good time. And we heard some good preaching. That does, but that doesn't make it a church, does it? A church is a body. All right. Now, um, with all that mind, by the way, all this in mind that I'm talking about, and you can go to Revelation 19 and talk about with the Lord in, 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 where she's dressed in white and everything. And, and it's the righteousness of the saints, by the way, not the Savior. You know, you're saved by, that's another reason why it's not, the bride isn't all, or the, white, the, the metaphor, the picture of it, it's not everyone that's saved. When she's brought forth in Revelation 19, it says that the white uh, linen is the, is the righteousness of the saints. Now, you didn't get to heaven by the righteousness of a saint. You got to heaven by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? But her white linen is the right. Why is that? She kept the doctrine of the Lord and she was faithful. And these are the people that were solid, that followed the Lord. And that is where they get the, white, the garments of white. And they follow. And by the way, after that, immediately after that wedding supper, the Lord's coming back. And, and man, he's going to take out in, in what we call the battle of Armageddon. He's going to take out a lot of people. And uh, you know who's right behind him? He says, let's go to there, Revelation 19. We might as well. I guess we can all, you, can, you can tell me to quit if you like, but, you know. <laughs> um, verse 7, Revelation 19. He says here, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And it was, uh, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, not Savior. They're not in heaven. They're, they're in heaven because of the Savior, not because of saints. But this is, goes beyond salvation. This is a reward for their faithfulness. And they don't put white on a bride that's not true and faithful. Amen. This is a, this is a true white wedding here. And that's because they're true to the doctrine and they, they kept the, the, the protocol, the doctrine of the apostles that the Lord Jesus Christ gave his people. Amen. And that's now if you look next, he, uh, he goes on, he talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, uh, and it says here in uh, verse, of course, in verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in verse 14, it says, were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in what? Fine white, fine linen, white and clean. That will be those that are here that's called his bride. Now, one thing that the Bible doesn't mention here, it'll be a white Tennessee walking horse. I just thought you ought to know that. All right. And our people in Wyoming know that. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a guarantee. I mean, whenever I say it, they say, yeah, Tennessee walking horse. I drill them on that because the Lord would only ride the best. But I just want to make sure you all understand that very clearly. All right. So on a white Tennessee walking horse, the Lord returns. Now, here's something else. And we talked about it. I briefly dealt with it. And by the way, let me mention one other thing. When you're dealing with all these things, you're thinking about this, about how the, the church is a picture of the, of the, you know, of the wife, the bride, and, and, and he is the head and the, and the husband. When Next time you read the Song of Solomon, keep that in mind and see if that doesn't unlock a whole bunch of new stuff for you. And you're like, oh, that makes sense to me now. And that's, that is speaking of the relationship of a New Testament church body with the Lord Jesus Christ, her head. Now, uh, something else on that. We mentioned, uh, there's another thing about a New Testament church. And I mentioned there was three parts, and you've got to have all three parts. And we have, I, I wrote here, and you, you might want to write this down. And if you have any questions, because I'm not going to be able to go in depth here. All right, three parts to, uh, these, these are what I would say maybe examples, or would you, you call them proofs, I guess, something, about a New Testament church. They are going to have all three of those, no matter what. They're going to have them. You can't say, well, we have two, because then you have none. Now, number one, we mentioned perpetuity. 
Obviously, this is 2015, and the church was founded in A.D. 33, or A.D. 30, whatever. I don't know the date, okay, A.D. 30, something like that, right? Obviously, the perpetuity, this, you, a church is birthed by another church. We exist here, but we're not Adam, all right? And just like all people die, but all of us are a product of somebody who died, correct? Don't, we have a lineage, right? Well, the perpetuity, a church will produce churches, and that's how, we, how a church continues. Now, now, people don't just go out and say, look, I want to start a church with, without being sent under the authority. Our brother here is sent under the authority of a New Testament church here, right? You're, they're sending you out. You didn't decide, I'm going to go and, then, and just go without any ordination, without any, you know, like you're just going to go and do your thing. No, that's not scriptural, okay? Uh, and that would be, I know people that do that. They call themselves Baptists, but they're really Protestant. They are not Baptist. I wish they'd take the name off. They just happen to agree with a lot of our principles, but they are not Baptists because they're not sent. All right, their perpetuity is important. You can be a, a uh, New Testament church, but if you're not perpetrating, you know, starting other churches, it's going to die in the vine, isn't it? So we have to be, in, that's why we do missions. We're involved in perpetuity. And the Lord promised that it would perpetuate and continue until the end of the world. The next thing is continuity. You know, if you're an electrician, any electricians here? A con- continuity is when you have the electrical circuit, right? And it comes from the word continue. And our continuity is on the apostles' doctrine, on, the, on which the church was founded, okay? The apostles' doctrine is the Lord Jesus Christ's doctrine. And so as long as you're in continuity, now, we could have this, and we could be, uh, we would, of course, to have this, you would have started with continuity, but what if we decided that, um, we're going to say that sal- you can lose your salvation. Or what if we'd say, how about we, let's, let's start experimenting and have tongues here. All right, do we have continuity with the apostles' doctrine? No, because we understand what tongues, you know, that was languages then. Uh, I, I, can you think of any other here? How about baptismal regeneration? We, we, we believe now that you have to be baptized to be saved, all right? Does that, are we, in, are we do we have the continuity? You're all, you're all with me, right? No, we don't. So you might have been, yeah, we were a New Testament church, but you done left it. You no longer have continuity. Now, continuity is important. That's why you can, you can support a missionary from another New Testament church, because you are together in continuity, a sister church. That's why you can accept baptism from another church. If you know it's a New Testament church, you say, okay, we'll accept that because we recognize the continuity of their doctrine and our doctrine under the headship of Christ, each autonomous, but we can, we can go together. Remember I talked about universe, universality? It's not talking about universal church. It's talking about it, the things are the same. And I, talk, I, used the, I used the illustration, for those who weren't here, uh, I used the illustration of a ship on the West Coast, and they have the same protocol that the Navy does, and then they go to the East Coast. It's the exact same thing. That's like a New Testament church. They're two different things. You know, there's uh, a church. They're all autonomous. You might, one church might pass the offering plate. Another one might have a box in the back. It's all okay if you have authority to do that. But the doctrine has a continuity. However, the other thing is succession. Now, the devil don't like this, and neither do most brethren that don't have succession. They don't like it. And the reason why is they automatically want to say, well, you believe in a hand that touched a hand that touched a hand, and you're into this endless genealogies. No, we don't. You can't prove, in the, by the way, you can't prove going all the way back to Jerusalem because you're going to lose, everything has been destroyed. All the records are destroyed. But we do know one thing. We have the same doctrine. And we do know one, another thing. You know that you were founded by a New Testament church, which was founded by a New Testament church. You didn't just start one, did you, somewhere in the garage? I know you all don't know for sure, but this is what, I'm ask, what I would ask. If a, a lot of churches started by a church split. Disgruntled members, they said, hmm, we don't like the color of the carpet. We don't like the way they did that. Hmm. And they go off and they start the, the second Baptist church, you know. And they go off there, and, and that's how they started years ago, and they've been going on for years. Well, do they have, were they founded by a New Testament church? No, they were founded by disgruntled members, who carnal people who wouldn't get right with God. Amen. It could be both of them are just wrong, too, by the way. I've seen it. I've seen churches split. I've seen people leave one church that was probably a good church, and they left, and, of course, they don't last. A lot of times they don't. They, they are not very successful. But a lot of times, if the church that came out of was just as carnal, you've got two carnal churches there, and it's all the same. And then along comes, you know, things happen. Sometimes God will bless. Sometimes he'll get a good preacher, and he'll help them. They'll learn some things. 
they're blessed, and then they, they, maybe they don't follow that light, but they're never going to come to anything, and they don't have a candlestick because the tabernacle had to be prepared God's way before he put the flame on there, right? Well, everything has to be done. It, you know what? People pr produce people. Everything produces after its own kind. And so succession is important. There's what's called principled Baptist, and there's what's called what they used to... These are old-timey terms, by the way, and they're, they're succession Baptists. Now, the, reason, the thing about it is, succession Baptists are principled Baptists that believe in succession. Principled Baptists do not believe in succession. They would be someone who would say, okay, we have a group of people way over here in Alaska, so people got saved, we're going to form a Baptist church, and you're the pastor. And that's it. And you continue that way. That's, but, but we're going to follow Baptist principles. And we, now, that's exactly what Roger Williams did. I, I told you about that, I think, last night. Did I mention Roger Williams? He decided to be a, he was called a Baptist, and he, he loved our principles. He believed in freedom, and he was castigated and persecuted as a Baptist. He was expelled from the, from the colony, all right? He was a good man, a lot of good stuff there. But he just, since he decided he was a Baptist, he had his friend baptize him, and then he baptized his friend. And then they were sh Shazam, they're baptized. And he, three months later, I believe it was, he... He relinquished that. He uh, said that baptism wasn't right. And he went off into perdition. No one knows what happened to Roger Williams, by the way. He took off. He left his church, and, and we don't know what happened to him. But the, in his historians, they say, wow, the Roger Williams was the first Baptist church. Actually not. John Clark founded the first church a year before that in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And John Clark was sent from that church I told you about where they had no pastor. And they, they, they wrote to Holland and said they knew there were some New Testament churches there. All the pastors were killed in England by Bloody Mary. They could not find any pastors. There was no one left. They said, please send us a man of God who will come here and give us the ordinances. And he can ordain elders that we can now continue. And they had men who were ready, who were trained, whatever, but they had to be ordained scripturally. These are what ancient Baptists believed. And that church that did that, they sent John Clark, and it was the first New Testament church in America. All right, but the thing is, it was so important to them, they actually believed in succession. Now, today, a lot of people, you, I'll just, I might as well name names. Uh, I know, like at Bob Jones University, they have uh, what, the, uh, actually, if you're not, I think most everyone has to take Baptist history there. And the reason why, it's very important to them that Baptists are Protestants. And uh, I've known people that went in Episcopalian and they came out Baptist, but they have Baptist principle. They don't have Baptist baptism. They don't have Baptist continuity. And they don't have Baptist perpetuity. But they call themselves Baptist because they believe in the basic things that we do. They believe in baptism by immersion. They believe in the autonomy of the church. They believe in the priesthood of the believers. You know, these, these are nice things. By the way, the Mormons believe in a lot of those things too. Uh, separation of church and state, Mormons adopted that. And so you can be anything and believe that. You can, any kind of Protestant can believe that. Evangelical free church believes those things too. But they don't have succession. And they don't, therefore they do not have continuity. Therefore they do not have perpetuity. And so uh, anyway, th those are examples. I, I don't know if, if you're getting... So don't let anybody get... By the way, what they, the, the people that hated Baptists, they started calling them landmarkers because they started calling it landmarks of the Baptist faith and, uh, and it was a dirty word. Be, to be a landmarker was a guy that believed that you had to have the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand and all that silly nonsense. That's not at all what they believed. They believed just what the Bible teaches. It was very important to the apostles in the apostolic times. Did you know when the disciples scattered out all abroad, they were preaching the gospel? Everybody was preaching the gospel. People were getting saved. What are you going to do with that? People were just getting saved. Well, you remember when, when Paul said he sent Timothy to go and ordain elders in every city? There's where your churches are started. You start with a group of people that are saved. You've got people that are saved already, but they're not a church. The, the Timothy goes in there. He, they've got men that are ready to preach, and they want to. He ordains elders in every city. Boom. That's their birth certificate. And that was very important to them to be a New Testament church, to have that candlestick, to know that they were, you know, they're, they're in line with the apostles' doctrine. And so that is what a Baptist is, and that's why they hate us. And that's, you know, people are going to hate you. And today, Protestants have gone, by the way, so far... They don't believe anything and they don't care about anything. You know, people are going to hate you the worst if you're going to believe the Bible and the protocol of the Bible. And if you're going to believe in this candlestick thing that God has a, has a way to plant a church. But the people are going to hate you the worst are the people that have the name Baptist on their name. It's always the brethren that hate you the worst, you know. So, and you know why? They're envious. They're in a, and so I know people that go around teaching Baptist history and they're principled Baptists. They're not... Well, really, it's a bad name because principled Baptists, we're principled, 
they just they adopt our doctrine, but they think you can just start spontaneously. And you know what? It always, always is going to be a big flaw. They're always going to have some issues, and they're always going to believe in a baptismal regeneration of a, of a spiritual type of thing, and it's always going to corrupt their doctrine. And they're going to be baptizing people, and they're going to come here, and they're going to want to join your church, and you're going to say, where'd you come from? And you're going to look at what that church believes, and you say, well, wait a minute. We love you. Glad that you followed in baptism and glad that you followed the light that you had. And I know your baptism was very important to you, but we have scriptural New Testament baptism here. And, uh, and so that's what a pastor's for is to, he's the one that's the gatekeeper to basically make sure that you're not bringing in another doctrine into the body that's going to cause a schism. All right, I, I have, uh, I could go on. I've got more. What is ordination? It's nine o'clock almost. I mean, I'm, I'm good as long as you guys are, but I don't, I don't want to, and of course, no one's going to want to say, no, brother, stop. I know that. <laughs> not, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, I, I'm, I'm just going to briefly hit, let, let me just hit some things just from my heart. The purpose of a church is, is like an embassy. You know, when I was in Israel, I, I, I remember walking down town Haifa, and then I see this building that's got an American flag on it. I'm an American, right? That was the American embassy. All right, now, I had no right to go into that embassy. I identified with the flag. I speak English. I have an American passport. But I have no right to go into that place and start sitting in the business meetings because I'm not appointed there. Now, the, the New Testament church is like an embassy. And the, the thing that we have to understand is there's two kingdoms. We are, this world is the kingdom of Satan. It's the kingdom of darkness. And it belongs rightfully to Satan. He got it at the fall of man. And he owns it rightfully. He's the prince in the power of the air. There are principalities and powers and so on. You understand all that in spiritual war and everything. Okay, when the Lord founded his church, he appointed that. that this church, the church is an embassy of the kingdom of God, which is in the land, the foreign land, of, that belongs to the prince in the power of the air. And the, our purpose there is against darkness. We bring light and we have dark, but everybody's not part of it. Just like I couldn't walk in and say, hey, I'm going to sit in the business meetings. No, you're appointed. That's why it's different. Everyone that says they're a Christian, of course, it's probably not, not everyone is a Christian, but uh, everyone that says they're a Baptist is not a Baptist. Everyone that says, you know, whatever. And so it's a matter of due appointment by the Lord that he appointed the New Testament church to be his embassy. And that's why, have you ever heard that where we're seated with him in heavenly places? Well, I tell you, you know, and I, for years I'd hear these, these preachers talk about it, that that's some mystical thing that we're floating around up there. In reality, I've heard people say that. Yeah, in reality, I'm really sitting up there with the Lord. That's not what it's, he said. It, it, the Bible, that verse is being raised with him. You're raised out of that baptistry, and you're sitting in the, in the embassy of God in the place of authority. The oldest widow and the youngest adult who is part of the New Testament church, you are all the priests before God, and you have authority. That's what it's talking about. You're sitting with him in this embassy, and the thing whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven, and the Lord recognizes that authority. That's why we believe in the priesthood of God. We don't, believe, we don't have a clergy. Because we're Baptists. We're New Testament Church Baptists. We don't have, we don't have a big I, little U. That's why when we vote, when we say, you know what, I believe that God has done this. And when, you, when God sends you a man of God, it's gonna be, you're, gonna, you're not going to be ask, you're voting on whether you like his looks. Okay? You're not going to be voting on whether or whatever. If, you're going to be voting, did God send this man? And in the Holy, you're going to go according to what the Holy Spirit has moved you. And every person who can vote, what, what's the voting age here? 18? Ours is 16. And ours is 16 and up, I don't care, and, and it don't matter to, we have a 93-year-old woman. She has as much power as I do, as far as the vote, and, and she, she, we expect that she's going to be on her face before God, and that she would be asking God, God, show us the answer, and I have respect for her, her what she says, and as for, for everyone else, they all, we have an equal vote, saying, you know what, I believe God has, has moved and God has revealed to us that this is the way he's going. And that's why we have an equal vote. That's why we're, you know, that's totally different from what is done in, in other types of churches. And so that's the purpose of the church. I'm going to wind it down. I've got, I can talk to you about ordination and, and all kinds of things, but I think it, it, I, I'll field questions. It, I said, I want to make sure I hear you right. The, what it is, there, okay, there are saved people, 
And it says here, those are the righteousness of the saints. And that's so, there are many people, and we see, I've got, I don't have time to build on this. It's just like not every saved person is part of the church, okay? In the church, we saw in Ephesians chapter 5, the church is likened to the bride, right? We see all that? Yes, all, all saved people be in heaven, all saved, we understand that, you're saved from hell. And, and, No, every, I believe every saved person will be part of the New Jerusalem. No, oh, I know what you're talking about. That, that also in the New Jerusalem is also called the bride. It, it, it's all a metaphor. It's a picture. So it's not an entity. But yeah, the, the, the New Jerusalem will come down as a bride. Yes, that would be. But that is the New Jerusalem. That's what it's talking about. The picture, the metaphor from Ephesians 5 of the, of, of, uh, the church is, you know, we subject to the Lord as our head. And, and that picture was brought into, and, and that's where we get the idea. I, I don't think bride is literal in the sense, I believe it's a metaphor and a picture. And, but I believe that there are, we know that there's going to be Christians that are going to, everything's going to be burned, but, but yet so, they'll be saved by, so is, uh, yet so is by fire. They'll be, lose everything. And, uh, and so you can lose your inheritance in the kingdom of God too. We know that from the Bible. We're even told about there's a saved brother who's committing fornication in 1 Corinthians 5. And we don't no whoremonger have any uh, inheritance in the kingdom of God. It doesn't say he's going to lose his salvation. We, no one believes you. We believe you, when you're saved, you're saved forever, right? But you can lose your inheritance. And, and you, can, you can mess up and you, you will have nothing to show. Oh, you'll be saved. Amen. I'm not going to hell. And so there is a difference. And uh, I could go into uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and we even see in heaven that we have co- you are coming to Mount Zion. And it's talking about there's the church of the firstborn, the general assembly. There was, um, someone help me out here. Uh, there was uh, the blood of Abel. There's all these things that we see in Mount Zion. I don't know how deep you guys want to get into this, but, but there is, the Lord makes a distinction even in heaven. There's the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. They're separated by an and. They have a common thing there. That means they're saved by the, probably the same grace, right? But there's a difference. And in the, in the, in the Greek city-states, people that were, they all, if you're from Macedonia, from Athens, from Sparta, you had representatives in the Senate. And they, were, uh, and they would go there and vote on your behalf. However, if you were not part of any of those, they had a general assembly. And the general assembly was picked up that would represent those who were not part of a proper city. And that's a, I believe that's the same thing. A general assembly, but all those are saved by grace of God. They're glad to be in heaven. Amen. They're our brethren in Christ. However, they're not the church of the firstborn. Saved Catholics are not part of the church of the firstborn. Church is not salvation. That's one thing we have to get over and over again because we're so used to we're being hammered. We hear church, you know, the rapture of the church. Well, it doesn't say that. The rapture of the saints. If you're saved, you're going to be raptured. So I don't know if I answered your question. I, and I can... Is, have I confused anybody? I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. These are what I've just done there. I've hit the high spots of many different sermons that I could do, and I, I usually like to build on principles so that you're riding with me. I build inductively, and then I would have proved that out what he's saying uh, on that to make sure you understood. But for me to go back and do that, it's gonna. I, I could, if you want me to come back, maybe you don't. But uh, I'd be glad to deal with that. And uh, but so I, I have to do the best I can in a very short shotgun blast. So, did anyone else have anything else? Any questions or doubts? I mean, I'm fine. I'm, if, you, if you're like, I don't believe that, brother, that's fine. Give me another chance to answer. Well, you're all with me, right? Brother, I thought you were going to say something. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I, I guess I'll let it go then. If you don't have any more, I, I would get into ordination and... Uh, what that is, why that is. There's a purpose for ordination, and that's why you have to know when you get a pastor coming, you need to know where to come from. You know, who, who ordained you? Is, is the one that ordained you a New Testament church? And uh, by the way, whoever's ordained, if you had one among you, you can have someone come and, and to, with your continuity under your authority, they can, bat, they can uh, or excuse me, they can ordain somebody here. And they would aid you in that, and you guys would continue then as a New Testament church because it's only you're autonomous. And you have the authority here. So, all right. Well, brother, I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll just go from there.